Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Once again, Movie Math has inspired an intense debate which warrants further discussion. And this time the topic is Batman vs. Superman vs. Captain America 3 on that May 6, 2016 release date. Uh, now, yesterday I said that with Captain America 2 not quite performing as expected in its second weekend, uh, that there was no way Batman vs. Superman would be moving. Uh, because I think that it looks, based on the returns of Man of Steel, uh, that they can take Captain America 3. Now, some of you uh, felt quite strongly about this uh, and had a couple of arguments saying that uh, Batman vs. Superman is definitely going to move. So let's discuss. Uh, the first, uh, I guess the first thing that should be addressed is a number of you who have said, oh Grace, Batman vs. Superman has already moved. And I would counter by saying it's moved a few foreign release dates. So while it's moved in your country, uh, and I'm guessing those are the people who are saying this, uh, it is still set for May 6, 2016 here in the United States, and also the UK and Sweden still. I checked this out as of today, as of recording this video, uh, Batman vs. Superman 2016 has not moved. Uh, now the reason it's moving some of its foreign release dates, I think, is it's getting its pieces in position. This is going to be a, a master showdown, and so you're really seeing strategy on the part of Warner Brothers. Now just like Captain America opened in a, uh, quite a few countries actually, 32 markets overseas prior to its release, uh, you're going to see Batman vs. Superman trying to do the same. Why? For the exact same reason. And that's to get those headlines, get those reviews out, get post big numbers in these other countries, which is going to be ammo in the PR campaign against Captain America 3. Uh, now, so that's what I think is going on with those changing release dates. It's just uh, Warner Brothers trying to get out ahead uh, and you know get some momentum going into that May 6th uh, release against Cap against Cap 3. Now some other people are saying uh, Batman vs Superman will definitely move because they just don't want to they have more to lose they don't want to hurt their film uh, you know opposite uh, any kind of property that has any kind of success like the Captain America franchise now that Captain America 2 has come along. Now, of course, Captain America 1 was a serious underperformer, and I, to some degree, I think that might be also what's affecting the performance of the second film. You, there are just some mainstream moviegoers who just can't believe the 180 that this uh, sequel has done, which it has. So if you're, you're on the fence, I implore you to check it out. However, I would like to also point out that many people, including myself, felt Need for Speed was the best racing movie ever made. China seems to agree, and a lot of you agreed, but yet I know people in real life, and people here have commented here on my review of Need for Speed, they don't agree. They actually did not like the film. Uh, so, you know, just because a whole bunch of us love Captain America, the Winter Soldier, doesn't mean that everybody loves it. Uh, and so you, you and also that has to be the case because uh, the word of mouth isn't as strong as I think we would like it to be. Because if it was, more people would be uh, checking out this film because especially because it's it, it, like, for instance, Cap, uh, Iron Man 3 opened at like uh, 175, which is almost, you know, like double almost what Captain America 2 opened at. So you would think it would have a better hold considering how good the film is because that word of mouth would have propelled more attendance, uh, which didn't show up for the first weekend. All right, so anyway, on to the second point of uh, uh, Warner Brothers isn't going to do this to their very important movie and they have a lot to lose. They do have a lot to lose, which is why they're not going to move. If they move at this point, they've already moved to 2016 to get out of the way of the Avengers. They just can't run from Marvel anymore. There's going to be a showdown at some point. There's only so many weekends in a, in a year for movies to be released. And as uh, the slates get more and more crowded, they're pushing movies into spring, uh, into seasons that usually you don't see big blockbusters. Look when Captain America the Winter Soldier had to open. It had to open on April 4th because it's too crowded in the summer. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of maverick moves. But eventually, we're going to have a showdown like this. So I think they just have to get it out of the way. Also, as I said, they've already moved it. Second of all, uh, or third of all, I guess, when they took this date to begin with, they knew there was a Marvel property parked there. Warner Brothers knew that Marvel had already called dibs on this date with an untitled Marvel project. And they rolled the dice anyway. Uh, and just because it came up Captain America 3 doesn't mean that they should now blink. Uh, they, they said, no matter what Marvel movie comes out here, we are opening our film on this date. Uh, and so I think that they need to stick to their guns. I think that they just can't run from Marvel forever. Uh, it's just, I think it's a really bad idea for them, and I think it, it diminishes their product. And I really do strongly feel, as I stated in Movie Math, based on the evidence, that Batman vs. Superman can take Captain America 3, no problem. Uh, and then also, I think that Marvel has a lot to lose as well, uh, but uh, some people said Marvel's not going to sacrifice Captain America 3. We'll see. 
Uh, I mean, I think it really is a game of chicken here, and I don't think either group is going to move. So I just, I think let's get it over with, let's get the showdown, uh, and I do believe that Batman vs. Superman will win, because I know a lot of you, you know, diehard fanboys and fangirls uh, really support Captain America 3 and the quality that that brought back to the superhero genre, and that's very commendable, but I think that the, co the combination of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, and leading into a Justice League movie, uh, Ben Affleck in this really iconic role doing something very different. He's brought on his Argo screenwriter, uh, Zack Snyder, I'm sure will deliver some very interesting action sequences. I just think it's going to be too tempting for people to pass up, and it's, it's going to be something like The Avengers, something like uh, Iron Man 3, uh, a, a property that people really know and love and are be very curious about. So I think they're just not going to be able to wait. They're going to, I mean, maybe people will see both. The weekend has a couple, of, you know, a couple of days, obviously. Uh, but I think that people are going to want to see this Batman versus Superman showdown. And Warner Brothers also must notice some degree what they have because it, they do have a lot to lose. So you shouldn't assume they make these decisions lightly to begin with. So I don't think anybody's moving. I think the showdown is going to happen. Uh, and I'm curious to see uh, if I've convinced any of you or you still feel that Warner Brothers is going to blink and move. Or Marvel maybe you'll feel will blink and move. But what do you think of the points that I've brought up to show that I don't think they're going to move? All right, so that's the first story of the day. The second story of the day is that they're talking a lot about the Spider-Man universe, and, you know, Sinister Six has been a big topic of discussion, but now we're moving over into Venom as well. They're really trying to hit home that they're creating a Spider-Man Spider cinematic universe to really try and get you hooked. As you know, we've discussed many times, uh, studios use these large, expansive franchises as a way to get you to see the current entry. They're like, if you don't come in now, you're going to be hopelessly lost when all these other movies come out. And it's a new way that Hollywood's getting you to come to the theater and see these movies. It's very clever. Uh, it's, you know, it's a way that people get people to continue to watch television shows. They have that hook. And we've rarely seen it in movies because it used to be so long between entries in a single franchise or a single trilogy. That's when a, a franchise used to just be a trilogy, but now they've become these mammoth uh, franchises with, you know, different threads and uh, storylines that interconnect and, you know, jump over here. And it's just very interesting to see. Kind of like when you read comic books. So it's interesting to see that web, haha, -ha, Spider-Man, um, be applied to film. But anyway, they've moved the discussion over to Venom, uh, or Agent Venom. You know, if you read the comics, if you're reading what's going on with Venom right now, uh, Flash uh, Thompson, uh, a amputee, double amputee from the war, you know, he was a soldier, uh, and he found another way to serve his government, and that's by wearing the symbiote uh, and being able to control it and kind of making himself almost like the Punisher a little bit. Uh, and, you know, uh, taking the, the Venom symbiote and shaping it instead of that monster that was made so famous uh, back in the early days on the Spider-Man comics, you know, making it into a, a military look. Uh, but so anyway, they're talking about the, the movie, and someone said, oh, wouldn't it be great if Carnage, you know, a, a fan or a viewer or a reporter, I forget who exactly, said, oh, you know, what do you guys think of Carnage? And they kind of, you know, they kind of like were like, oh, you touched on a nerve there. Uh, stay tuned to some degree. That was their answer in short. And so you, people are starting to speculate now that you'll have a Venom versus Carnage movie. And also... The reason I brought this up is not only to talk about, you know, the expanding Spider-Man universe, but, you know, you saw a little bit of hint the other day of Paul Bettany talking about the vision on Jimmy Kimmel, I believe it was, uh, and saying, oh, you know, my power set, I can't tell you what it is, it's not going to be totally like the comics, they pick and choose, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it was really just such a small tidbit of a story, such a tease, but yet it still made big headlines. And uh, I'm curious to how you guys feel about the way Hollywood is kind of dangling these small secondary, uh, you know, second tier, third tier, fourth tier characters in front of us to try and get people excited about another property. Uh, do you think that works? Are you, do you want to see like a huge cast of characters? I mean, we've said that X-Men Days of Future Past looks too crowded to us, um, but yet, you know, we love it when we hear that maybe Cyborg will be in uh, Batman versus Superman. Uh, what is more important to you? Seeing all the characters that you love on the big screen or, you know, just getting the ones that are there done right? Or maybe you, maybe we all feel that they're getting them right finally, so we can kind of expand these universes. Uh, I mean, I don't know, I'm getting a little bit fatigued about all the, you know, the teases uh, about little small characters, and I'm just, I'm wondering how much can the Vision really be in the Avengers Age of Ultron? And then I'm wondering, are people going to be really interested? You know, the mainstream moviegoer who doesn't read comics. You know, when you're a comic book reader, you read several in a day, or, a, or the course of a few days, when the comics come out on Wednesday. It's a big stack, but people only see about one to two movies a month, your average moviegoer. Uh, so they can't kind of voraciously consume uh, this material the way a comic book 
reader can. So I'm just, I don't know if it's going to be able to translate this structure. Uh, and, you know, or I don't know if people are going to be interested in a Venom versus Carnage movie. Perhaps if they get a movie star. And, you know, speaking of movie stars, I've been thinking about it, and perhaps that is something that's hurting Captain America, uh, the Winter Soldier. It doesn't have any movie stars in it. Some of you might argue that Samuel L. Jackson and Scarlett Johansson are movie stars, but I would counter you that they are not consistent box office performers. They are certainly well-known actors, but they are not movie stars. They are not, you know, they're not like Robert Downey Jr. So maybe if Venom were to get a star that was really some people that people were interested in, it would help that film. Uh, but I just think Venom versus Carnage. Then I think you're just going to watch the whole movie like some people are watching some current Marvel movies, going, "Where's Spider-Man? Why didn't he show up? You know, like why isn't Andrew Garfield running through this movie? I don't understand why this is happening without them." It makes perfect sense in the comics for some reason. I guess because they see it seems smaller. Uh, you know, but I think in a, in a movie you're like, uh, you don't quite understand why your big characters haven't shown up and they're only kind of referenced. It's something the movies are going to have to get over eventually because it's really an obvious thing when you're watching them. Alright, so that's the second story of the day. The third story is, ah, another headline about China. Two actually that I've combined into a single story. And that the first is that Legendary, uh, Legendary Pictures, of course, so many of you are familiar with them. They are very very fanboy friendly uh, production company. They did, of course, the Christopher Nolan Batman films. They have a lot of great films coming up in their slate. They're behind Pacific Rim and uh, Godzilla as well. Very exciting company. Uh, very forward thinking company. And Thomas Tull is actually the head of them. Uh, he, he, I interviewed him for the Man of Steel Red Carpet. He was great. Really great uh, businessman. I think very smart. Uh, you know, he was really uh, had Chadwick Boseman there, seemed to be his personal guest at that premiere, so I think he has a good eye for talent. Uh, but anyway, he's also, ha I think, he has a good, eye, uh, a good eye for trends and opportunities. And he has made a deal with the China Film Company, uh, a big Chinese uh, uh, company film group in China, obviously, uh, to really inject, uh, in, um, inject a lot of capital into Legendary. They're going to be a big financer of both the Seventh Son film, that's that Jeff Bridges, Julianne Moore film, which has been pushed forever. I don't know why it needs more money put into it. Maybe they're trying to fix some special effects, or maybe there are reshoots. Uh, they're being mum on that, but that's, so, that's now set to come out February 6, 2015. And they're also going to be using quite a bit of this money for, war, for Warcraft, the Warcraft film that Duncan Jones is directing. He finally got himself a blockbuster. That comes out March 11th, so that's your early March date that 300 Rise of the Empire came out on. Uh, Alice in Wonderland and Wolverine is set for that 2017 first weekend in March. That's a typical uh, release date for those outs outside the box blockbusters. Wolverine doesn't really fit in there, but I think that's a good release date for Warcraft. Uh, 300, of course, the original 300 came out there uh, as well. Watchmen on that date. So Warcraft is hitting 311 2016 and will also be financed by this deal with China Film Company. But this is where it gets interesting. This money isn't just under the table. When you watch these two movies, the China Film Company logo will show before the film. That is a huge deal in my opinion. And this just goes to show that it's a two-way street. We are really wanting to put our movies, I believe it's like, a we can put a maximum of 34 U.S. movies into the Chinese film market each year. Uh, they're trying to break that down, which I'll get into, a, into in a second. But not only is Hollywood trying to make a lot of money off of China, but China is trying to make a lot of money off of Hollywood. They want to get in here, uh, you know, make movies together. And some people are saying this is just an investment. I saw one comment on this story that I really didn't like. Uh, it was on another website. It wasn't any of you. And someone said that, you know, China Film Company wanted to help make movies that were, you know, very uh, appreciative of Chinese culture uh, and embraced that. And someone said, oh, this is just a money deal. Uh, I bet they don't even know what they mean when they say that. And I thought that was very insulting. We've been having quite a debate about this over with Godzilla, that, you know, Asian culture isn't respected enough, uh, you know, Japanese in that case. Uh, but I, I think that it would be wonderful if China Film Company is putting up all this money. I think there should be some Asian characters. I think there should be some, you know, Asian culture depicted not stereotypically but respect and with new depth. Wouldn't that be exciting? If we are, if China, the if people in China love movies so much, they're putting so, Captain America just pulled down 80 million over there. If they're enjoying the movies so much, and we're enjoying movies over here, and we all love movies together, why can't we make some movies for all of us to enjoy together? I think it's very exciting, uh, and I don't think we should be feeling we're competing with China, uh, you know, for who's going to, who's going to have the attention, who's going to be the people that, uh, the suits at the studios make decisions to try and please. Why don't they just try and please all of us? Because I think at the end of the day, we all enjoy just a good movie. Uh, so, and you know, I, I think a movie that's representative of both. I think it's really horrible to ask, you know, um, you know, all these Chinese moviegoers to see all these films uh, just, you know, that are only American. Uh, now, of course, that's uh, somewhat addressed by the fact that Chinese films do the best in China. Uh, so I think that if U.S. wants to truly get those kind of huge numbers, even bigger than the ones they're posting, like Captain America with 80 million, although that, that's only the beginning of Captain America's run there, um, 
you know, they, they should ha have more Chinese culture reflected there. But also the other thing is, is that the first China and U.S. Film and TV Expo will take place in Los Angeles in September. And that's going to be a lot of Chinese distributors, uh, U.S. distributors, production companies all coming together to talk about further, even more breaking down the barriers and the regulations that are keeping them from truly just being, uh, melding the two film industries. So it's very exciting times. I hope they can accomplish it. I wonder how you guys feel. Do you want to break down the barriers with other countries? You know, as I've said many times in the comments, you know, discussing things with you guys, uh, we're the only country that doesn't really uh, extensively show foreign films. We just mostly repurpose them through our own studios. Uh, everywhere else, you go to a marquee, you see films from around the world, and they play in, 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 uh, just on par. They're treated the same way as our films, or at least closer, you know, not the way they are where they only play in art house films here in the United States. Do you want to see this breakdown, or do you like just seeing American films? Do you only want to see the American versions? Because remember, these foreign countries are stepping up their game and creating content that uh, creatively and technologically uh, is on par with our films. So why can't we just, why can't we enjoy just good movies, as I'm saying? So that's the third story of the day. The question of the day comes from uh, Terrell Williams, and Terrell really worked hard to get my attention, so uh, I wanted to make sure I answered his question today. So Terrell says, question for you, Grace. 2016 Superman and Batman movie has the potential of being a financial, record-breaking box office smash. Could this open the door for more? I love, yeah, I'm, I'm reading it as Terrell wrote it. I think it deserves that. So, uh, could this open the door for more possible crossover films like a Star Trek original series, I like that you're very specific there, Terrell, meets Star Wars, Indiana Jones, and Captain America set in World War II. Sidney Bristow, alias in The Black Widow, James Bond versus Ra's al Ghul, or a Batman and King Chala, aka the Black Panther team up. Someone the other day just referred to Black Panther. Uh, I saw a comment saying he was like Batman. I think that's very interesting. Where is the Black Panther movie? Uh, what do you think about this, Grace? Wouldn't it be cool if different movie studio executives put their corporate and political egos aside for just a moment and made this a reality? Who wouldn't want to see Mr. Spock and Darth Vader in the same scene? Pure awesomeness. As always, thanks, Grace. Please keep up the good work. Thank you, Terrell. I am so glad that you not only had this much passion about your question, but that you were passionate about me answering it. I really appreciate that. I'm honored. So let's discuss. I have to say, this is a niche market, this kind of crossover uh, thing. I don't think that people, I think that, you know, you have to set up some kind of rules. I think a free-for-all takes away some of the seriousness of these properties. And seriousness is very big in Hollywood right now. It links to the way they're treating their properties. But audiences like it, uh, uh, creators, you know, artistic personas like directors and actors like it because it allows them to make these kinds of movies without having to sacrifice any of their artistic integrity. Uh, so everything's, everyone's taking things very serious right now. Also, I have to say, corporate and political egos while that is in play, it's also a financial aspect here. If you had these team-ups, how would the money be split? How, which studio, then you start to get into a discussion, it's like, well, what's the real draw here? You know, are people, you know, Star Wars, I think, is arguably a bigger brand than Star Trek. Would that mean that Disney would get uh, a bigger piece of the box office than Paramount's Star Trek? Um, so I think that's some kind of an issue that you have going on there. Uh, also, I think your mainstream moviegoer, Yet, maybe they're getting better at this, but I think your mainstream moviegoer who isn't trained to, you know, figure out characters and storylines and is already very familiar with the ideas of alternate universes and crossovers and the idea that this can happen, I think this is still something that seems more comedic to them, more like something you would see on Saturday Night Live, like a joke. So I think that we're not quite there yet with educating your non-comic book, you know, your non-fanboy audience as to the benefits of these kinds of crossovers. So I think that you're not going to be, I mean, you don't see them in comic books either. You don't, you know, there was one time like a Marvel versus DC crossover, but, you know, the companies, I don't know if they really hate each other that much. I mean, I don't know how much of that is for publicity, but, you know, they're not on good, they're not on friendly, happy terms, at least uh, officially, of the, you know, Unofficially, these people have worked at both companies and they know each other. But the same can be said for movie studios. You have a lot of crisscrossing between the studios. Oh, I used to work for Warner Brothers, you know, and now I work for Disney. Of course, you know, I, you know Alan Horn now is the head of Disney. He used to be the head of Warner Brothers. So, and you know, um, <clears throat> we just talk about a lot of company, uh, you know, a lot of suits moving around. So those lines are blurred. So I guess they already are having crossovers in Hollywood. But I think that you're, the more likely place that you're going to be seeing something like this is when characters are used for goodwill things. Like for instance, when James Bond teamed up with the Queen of England for the opening of the Olympics. I think that was a nice idea. Um, and so personally, while I can understand, you, I guess my answer is Terrell, is that 
I just think right now, and, and maybe someday when these films have run their course and they're not getting the same box office that they quite are, someone will decide to say, hey, you know what, let's give it a shot. Uh, but except for your Sydney Bristow, that's television and film. No one's going to do that kind of a crossover. Um, and Indiana Jones, maybe the, someday they'll have an Indiana Jones cameo, I can, or a Captain America cameo in an Indiana Jones film. I can actually totally see, that might be the best one that you came up with, because they actually are the same company now. So that's, if you can get uh, different kinds of um, properties that are still owned by the same company, Indiana Jones and Captain America are both under the Disney umbrella, it would be cute in an Indiana Jones film. I mean, they've already shown they're willing to do anything with um, Crystal Skull. It would actually be cute to have an Indiana Jones movie and have Captain America show up, uh, or maybe an ice. Uh, so I'm not quite sure how the timelines line up, but I think that, that would be that that I could see happening. You know, and the question is, will Disney perhaps do that? So I have my only hurdle, my only stumbling block here is that I don't know if people would take this seriously if it would devalue the characters by bringing them together. So I want to know how you guys feel. Is this something that you really want to see? I mean, we say we want to see Wolverine and, and Spider-Man go over to the Avengers, but that's because they already exist there in the comics. What do you think of these fresh crossovers? Do you want to see Star Trek and Star Wars crossover? Do you want to see a Captain America cameo in an Indiana Jones film? Uh, who would that hurt? Uh, either character or help both characters. I just want to get kind of, you know, if, if I want to see, uh, I want to take like a litmus test and see how you guys feel about this, because I feel it right now, uh, it just seems a little bit like a free-for-all and not kind of the structure that, you know, people like in their entertainment. Uh, so that's my thoughts on your question, Terrell. I guess it's an open-ended uh, answer, and we'll see how everybody else feels as well in the comments down below. But I like your question, and I think that your kind of love for these characters and seeing them together is a big reason why they're successful at all. And so I applaud your enthusiasm, and Hollywood really should take note of anybody being this excited about anything. And I think there is, are some people who want to see this crossover. People have been calling over for crossovers in the comics for a very long time, and maybe Hollywood will be the place that gives it to them. Uh, but as I said, your best idea was Indiana Jones and Captain America. I, if I were Disney, I would perhaps think of doing that, because Indiana Jones needs a little bit of a goose, and uh, I think Captain America is doing pretty well. All right, so write your thoughts down below, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, please let uh, me know and everybody know what you think of the today's top three stories, Terrell's question about crossovers, and let me know what you'd like to see covered tomorrow, any questions you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.